Hello. What's going on, Karine Maria? What's going on? What's up? Uh, hope everyone is well. I'm just trying to share this uh, link here now that we got started. If you guys can do the same for me, that would be helpful. Kenneth, what's going on? Clevon, how are you all? Let's uh, try to get the word out that we're alive and get here. Everybody else, if you checked in, give me a quick hi so I can give you a shout out. Move on. Who else is here? Give me a quick shout. Mr. McCook, Peter, what's going on? Gary, yes, we're live and active. Got a couple of things you want to discuss tonight. Seems like it was an eventful, eventful week in our. Uh, in our space, so yeah, let's um, let's try to cover a couple of things and see how it goes. So Henry, what's up, boss? What's good? Um. Let me see, trying to share this link. Get everybody know we're live. Yeah, I see it. <clears throat> uh, things are good on our side. Yeah, uh, you know, doing what we do. You know, we end kidding season, and it's about uh, making sure they get to weaning the way we like. You know, fast growth and healthy growth, and get them off the farm. Um, other than that, we're just doing what we do. And keeping our people informed and, you know, sharing information as much as we can. Um, outside of that, it's just business as usual. Um, yeah. Um, I don't even know if Trudy's going to be on tonight because I know she got some things going on. So I think I'm flying solo tonight. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, that, that one kid that she fall in love with. Yeah, you can tell that one is special to her. She's like, he's so pretty, so pretty. Like the 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 good get seem to get that more than I do, <laughs> and that's a fact. Um, but it's all right. You know, one thing when it's time come for them to get sold or something, she, she don't feel that way. There's only two goats on the farm that. Nobody can touch. That's the two females that she bottle fed. Outside of that, 
Everybody is free to go, except for a box. One time she was all about Joe. And then one time she had to deal with Joe and realized Joe was too powerful. Then Joe was no longer a favorite. Then Samson came and it was all about Samson until he started peeing on himself. And then she's like, nope, no more Samson because he smells all the time. So I think she's sticking to females now. Yeah. Um, that's it. All right, let's uh let's get into this. So tonight, I wanna, I wanna, one is I wanna get into off the bat. I wanna talk about this pretty larceny situation that is dominating our space right now, or in the last week. Um. And two things I want to address about it. One is I feel I feel it for any farmer that loses their goat because of you know pretty larceny. Oh Shane, what's going on, son? Um that's number one. It's we're living in an environment where that seems to be somewhat normalized which is not good. It's definitely not, it's definitely not um, acceptable to be honest, but it is what we, the, the environment we live in. I see that gentleman lose 16 of 22 or something animals. I don't know the exact number, but he lost a lot of animals. Um, and then Apparently, there was another situation because I see Leon Golding posted that if you missing animals to go to report to a state uh, police facility to identify animals, and there was some recovery there. So we got to applaud that. We got to give the, um, the officers involved or the community that's involved in that, give them some props because as I post underneath it, encouragement, sweet and labor, right? So however it happened, whatever the process was, there was recovery. And we got to give thanks for that. And then there was another situation in our community with a lady that we know where she lost three animals and it was on video. Now, here's the thing that I want to get into when it comes to pretty last thing. And this is, we've had... We have addressed pretty last thing on I go chat twice with the then assistant commissioner of police, Bishop um, Welch, right? And he's, he had given us a lot of pointers, a lot of um, advice on how to mitigate pretty larceny in our operation. He was on, I, I go chat telling people what to do, what the approach should be. Now, in this situation, this new situation, there's a lot of things that I have to say, us as a community, we have to look, our, look at ourselves in the mirror and, and ask ourselves, what is our responsibility when it comes to protecting our property. What is our responsibility? Dr. Young posted that pretty larceny is the biggest thing plaguing the growth of the sector. And I agree with her. And this is why I agree with her. For a whole year, almost, we did not actively advertise Cover Ranch or promote Cover Ranch because the people around us, when we started, they tell us not to do it because they're going to steal the goats. We said, okay, we'll come up with a security system to protect the goats. Nonetheless, they still warn us that, yeah, they're going to come take the goats. They're going to go thief the goats. If people know it's there, they're going to come thief the goats. So naive and not knowing, we're like, okay, 
You just won't advertise it and tell people that it's there. And we instruct workers not to say anything, not to whatever, not tell people about it. But I got a call one night from Lincoln Ware, Big Mouth Casey. And he's like, yo, what's the deal? Your secret agent, why you don't talk about the farm? Why don't you put it out there? Why don't you post that you have animals? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? Why don't you do that? explain to him? Like, dude, I don't want him to come take the goats. I don't, I'm not there. I'm not on the farm every day. Like, I'm concerned about that stuff. And he schooled me that night. Number one, he schooled me on using the community to protect the farm. Let the people in the community know that the farm is there to help the community, help them support, help the, the, the farm is there to help grow the community. They will in turn protect it and look out for you. Don't make them feel like they're outsiders. Second, not talking about the farm, not promoting what, I, what we do is hindering the growth of the, of the operation. It is not. It's not helping. So we, in turn, are making the prospect of greedy larceny hinder the growth of the operation and everything else. So I changed my whole perspective on it and decided that, okay, I'm just going to put it out there. I'm going to put the necessary pieces in place. I'm going to increase my security uh, apparatuses. I'm going to do what I need to do. Mind you, the farm already had proper security when it comes to how I envision it, how the deterrence, all the consultation I did with different security people, local people in Jamaica that's protect their operation, what we what we need to do to protect it. I already had that in place. So then I took another look at it and said, okay, what can I add to it to create more deterrence? And we did that. You know what I mean? So Doing in putting all those things in place, I'm like, okay, the only thing now I can do is have good relationship with the community, go down to the station, introduce ourselves, let people know what we do, get a, a direct number, and you know, continue accordingly. Now, what I'm about to say may upset some people, but at, on I go chat, this is what we do. We talk the truth and we issue the information needed. If you have an investment, if you start a, a business, whether it's the corner shop, whether it's the a supermarket, whether it's it's um, a bank, distribution, um, thing, wholesale, hardware, whatever it is, you will not open it up, do business all day, and then walk away at 6 o'clock or 7 o'clock and leave it open. Nobody's going to do that. <clears throat> so if your good operation is a business, if you are looking at it as a business, then knowing that you live in Jamaica where that is an issue. You think I only go empty for Jamaica. If you left that shop open, you'll come back and find it empty. That's a fact. How many videos you guys see where a truck loaded with material get into an accident and the man them clean it up? The people in the community just start taking things because in there, I think a crash, free for all. So if you are running a business, are you going to just end of day, 
walk away, take up your, your bag, pick up the money where you make, and leave your commodity wide open. Leave the store open. No, you're not. You don't have grill. You don't have camera. You don't have alarm system. You don't have shutters. All kinds of things going to be at this store. Why aren't we having the same approach to our livestock operation? Why can't we say, okay, I'm going to start a goat business. I'm going to go on 10 goat. Why can't we say, yo, how do I protect these 10 goats? Why can't it be a part of the original planning? It should be. You can't put it on other people to protect your property. We can't just keep saying the same things over and over, doing the same things over and over, and expect a different result. Because we know we can't control people's behavior. We can't control what happens to pe what people do outside. Even if you put up a sign and say, yo, don't enter. If you have something over there they want, and they're of the kind that will come take it illegally, they will come take it. So I believe people should factor in security and protecting their investment right off the bat. That's the first thing they should consider. Because if you're going to open a store, you're, that's one of the first things you're going to think about. How do I stop people from coming come take the products I have in the store? How do I stop them? The same approach needs to be taken. It's that simple. The same approach needs to be taken when it comes to livestock operation. Even if you plant kalaloo and them things, try to protect it because it's, a, it's your livelihood. Do what you need to do to protect it. And we see that people are aware the cost of goods. And they figure, and it's easy to get rid of it. It's easy to sell it. It's easy to butcher it and sell it. Or sell it to a butcher for cheap or cheaper than the market value. So butcher is quickly to pay it. Or mana keep a dance, you butcher it and sell them the meat, sell them the manish water kit and everything. It's easier than a cow. It's easier than a pig. A pig makes so much noise. Goats seem to be easy target. One, goats are most of the time are friendly if you got if this if it's small numbers and they're being handled by humans every day, then they're less likely to make noise or do anything. They'll just follow. Especially if they're in ropes. Easy. Easy target. They just follow the rope. Big up, Dave. Whoever else, come on. Enough blessing. JB Farm, what's going on? So, I'm, I'm imploring people, imploring everybody in this, on this live right now, to take a more serious look at your operation and see where you can improve on your security. You can't send out 30 goats to Grace without supervision and don't anticipate that somebody may take one or two or three. We see the videos all the time. Them load up all 20 goats in our pro box.
He can't take it for granted. You could be in the community for 20 years doing this, and nobody's gonna take a go. And a man will be driving by and see it. A whole bunch of goats just out there. And he circled back and realized the goats are still out there with nobody in sight. Come back a third time and see nobody, and just say, okay, yo, I'm taking a couple of these. It's it's it's, it's amazing. You can't have that kind of investment just roaming the street, knowing the environment we live in, knowing how people are when it comes to stealing goats. So we have to take it serious. We can't wait for the government to do it because we've been talking about it forever. We can't wait for them to change the laws for it to be more serious. We can't do it. We have to protect our own. We have to look at it and say, okay, how do I protect them? Do we you know, keep them locked up? Do an intensive system? Or if you have the time, then you take them out yourself four hours a day, five hours a day, and bring them back. How do you do it? Figure out how do you do it. You have to look at it that way. You can't just send them out. The gentleman with the 20 some goats, like, I don't know the details, but from what I'm told, from the questions I've asked some people, the goats go out on their own and somebody come back and tell them that, yo, I think somebody's taking your goats. So I think we need to take a serious look at it. We definitely need to take a serious look at how we start our operation, what is prioritized. It doesn't make any sense having a lot of goats and at every given moment you can lose them. And you're not losing them because they died. You're not losing them because an accident on the farm. You're not losing them because something like a sickness or something. You're losing them because they're not being supervised or they're not protected. This doesn't make any sense. I would suggest that everybody take a serious look. And if you're mentoring someone or if somebody call you asking you, yo, I want to get into the gold business, what do you suggest? That should be the number one thing. You tell them, before you decide to buy a goat or build anything, look at how you're going to protect them. Nobody tell me, but what they did tell me is that some of them are going to teeth the goat them. That's what they keep telling us over and over and over and over. Yeah, they're going to teeth the goat them. They're going to steal the goat them. So in my head, I'm like, do I let that deter me from starting an operation or do I figure out a way to protect the goat them and have a better chance of success? Because everybody we are coming a goat business, them can't tell me that they don't know the risk. Unless you come from Timbuktu or somewhere. You can't tell me you're starting a goat farm in Jamaica. You don't know the risk. Of course, you know the risk. If you're operating in Jamaica, if you grew up in Jamaica, if you've been in Jamaica for a minute, number one, if you're getting into the goat business, you better do like three years of research, I suggest. You know, get the lay of the land, talk to some people. And if you do your, your research and talk to people, they will tell you. You should figure that out because it's a real risk. You know, seriously. You shouldn't get in if you don't do that, the research. If you don't do 
your due diligence and talk to some people, get a mentor, visit some other farms. You know, you shouldn't, shouldn't start. Should not start. Don't waste your money. Figure it out first. In fact, securely fence a piece of land without nothing upon it. Securely fence a piece of land that you're going to put your operation without even a goat or a little shed. Securely fence that. And then say, yes, I'm going to build something in this. One. I think that's a great approach, actually. You know what I mean? Number one, secure the piece of the, the, the space you're gonna put your goat them in. Secure it and watch it for a while and see if anybody go by it. You know what I mean? If you pass by there, go back there and say, I'm on a goat over there a, a grace. You don't say somebody penetrated thing. Serious. I really think there's no excuse. I'll go as far as say there's no excuse. Yeah, you can have excuse, but is it a valid one? Is it really valid for you to look at me and say, yo, when come take the goat, take two goat from me and how them take them? Where were the dogs? Did they cut the fence? They broke off a lock. No, I'm climbing and coming and take them. Wasn't secure. No, no deterrence, nothing. If a man call me and say, "Yo, you know, say, I'm take, I'm come and take three goat last night," you know. So really, uh, yeah, man, them all chop up my dog, them in a bridging. That's a whole different story. Because at least he had some form of security to protect his property. And it was working, and they find a way to get through by killing his animals or whatever it is. That, that's giving yourself a fighting chance. And Dave's asking, what's the typical cost of fencing? I never really price it out per foot or something. Maybe somebody else who have more experience in that can put it in the comments. I really never price it out per foot because I just based it on the stuff I needed to have a secure fence. Yeah. <clears throat> and it all depends on what you're using to fence it. You know what I mean? How how um, sophisticated is your is your fence? You know what I mean. Here, Peter is saying his fence was six hundred thousand. But what, what were you? How many? What was what was this square footage or the acreage that you were uh, you fenced for six hundred thousand? Yeah, you know, it depends on what you use. But at the end of the day, try to figure it out. Come up with a plan. Talk to some people who are experiencing this. And see what's the best approach you should take to deter people from coming in. Give them some work. Somebody once told me, yo, teeth don't like work. That's why them teeth. If them have to do too much things to get to the final product, then can't then not bother with it. Because time is of essence and in the like light. They don't like too much work. If they have too much issues, too much steps to get in, then not bother with it. They want to be quick in and out. And there's many ways you can achieve this. Affording, affordingly, cost effective. There's many ways to do it. You know, 
there's many ways to approach securing your your space that you have your livestock. You know what I mean? Even if you just build a goat house in a secure way, very secure, proper gate on it, give them some work. You know what I mean? Invest in some dog. I find that dogs work very well because they don't really like dealing with the dog dog thing. They the thieves for some reason don't like dealing with dogs. Especially you got four dogs or something. Could have two nice big dog and two little mongrel that's make nice. And bark and run run and make nice. And that's a good security system to begin with. Gary, if you're looking dog, let's go on one of those groups and post that you're looking dog. People are always posting puppies for sale. Or some people give them away. You know? My my advice to you is if you bring a mature dog on the farm, you know, make sure that dog is always locked up and away from your animals, have no access to your animals. But if you want to integrate the dog to, to protect and love the animals, you have to get a puppy that lives with them. You know what I mean? You got to get a puppy that lives with the, the animals and grow up with the animals and love the animals, think they're a goat, or just think that, yo, I'm, I'm here to protect them. Like, our dog Sarge is like that. She came with the first seven goats, and she grew up with them. And as far as Sarge is concerned, that's her family. Nobody touched them. Nobody come close to them unless it's authorized in her in her eyes which means it's me trudy cruz i don't think anybody else is allowed to touch a goat at this point even we have a new guy he's only allowed to go in a pen or whatever but he's not allowed to grab a goat you know if he's gonna grab a goat sarge better be nowhere in sight because sarge will let him know y'all dude you haven't gotten to that stage yet just keep, just do that stuff what you do and don't touch a goat. And people don't believe me when I tell them until they witness it. Until they witness it, they're like, oh, really? He's all good with me all day until I touch a goat. Yep. It's going to take a while for you to go through the probation period for Sarge to allow you to hold a goat. If you don't go through that period, you can't hold a goat. You can't touch a goat. Keep Stay out of the way. Go clean, cut, cross, do whatever you do, but don't touch a goat. And that's because Sarge grew up with them and protect them with everything she has. You know? And testimony to that, I'm telling you guys, seriously, we should think and we should talk about it more. You know what I mean? We should talk about it more. We should actually talk about these things more. Because it doesn't matter how pretty your goat look or how fat them look or how whatever. Yo. You only let people know they can come take it if they see that your system is weak, your security system is weak. They will come and take the animals. So I don't want to labor this too much because we've been over it so like a couple of times already. But Trudy, she's a smart woman. She always have this thing on the farm where she say, yo, I say it 24 times before they get it. Repeat the instruction or the rule or regulation or procedure 24 times before it actually sits in. So I guess we have to talk about this stuff over and over and over. And we got to remember, too, there's new people that are coming in thinking them can get by by one and two little thing, cut corners and stuff. No, you will pay the price. And it will take a while. It may take a while. Maybe tomorrow, maybe a month from now, or maybe two, three years from now. 
the gentleman that lost his um his 16 goals or how many he recover, he's been in it for a while. He's being mentored by one of the you know most respected farmers. But if you're gonna mentor somebody, I tell them the truth. There's Miss Wilson. Um, you gotta tell them what's up. Hey y'all, welcome Trudy. Um, there she is in the comments. Give her a big warm welcome. Um, <laughs> yes, Chelsea, you're right, Natty, you're right. It's like they think they can get away with it, you know? They think they can do it and nothing and get away with it. You know, I hear a lot of people say, yo, nothing in my neighborhood, man can't come in, a man can't this, a man can't that. But remember that the lady close to us that lost three goats, the guy came in and knew exactly where to go. And it's not somebody she recognize. You know what I mean? It's not somebody she recognized. So somebody told the, that guy exactly where to go. Somebody told that guy. Somebody told that guy. So, because he came in and he went directly to the spots where those three animals are. And he looked in to make sure it's what he's looking for and then he moved accordingly. He didn't hesitate. So, the lady may not know him. The people across the street doesn't recognize him. But he seemed to know the layout of the farm because there was no light over there. He just came in and went straight to where he needed to go. So you can say, yo, that stuff can't happen in my community, can't happen in my neighborhood, can't. No. The peeps, there's people around you or visit or whatever that will tell somebody what to do. And they share the 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 the, the, pro, the proceeds, you know. So I suggest to take all precautions. I'll give you guys five things we do at Cabra Ranch that help us with deterring people from trying to steal our goats. Number one thing is we have proper fencing of a goat yard. Lights that covers the goat yard. Secure, um, security cameras. Um, animals like dogs in the goat yard that covers the goat yard. And then we have to make sure there's outside lights at on the, 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 the house. And everybody that visits the farm for any reason has to give us a valid government ID and we take a copy of it, take a picture of it. Because if anything happens on the farm, we have a list of people that we don't know that just came to visit or come to pick up an animal or whatever. And those people, those names and whatever, and in contact info and everything is given to the police. They are the first people the police them need to go talk to. And the way we see it is it's a deterrence. 
it's it's if you come visit and say in under the the, the this guy that you're buying a goat, but what you really are come do is scope out the thing. The next thing before we go to that, next thing is that I don't let strangers through the goat yard gate. If you don't have official business like a vet, nutritionist, or my best friend, my good friend, or whatever, no, you're not going in there. Because that's why we have the lounge at the front where you can look through the fence and see the, the goat then when you come for by. You're not going in there to see when all my things set up. So now back to the ID thing. The reason we do that is to create a deterrence. So if you have any plan, and I tell them, it's not like me just me tell a man, say, yo, it's one, security reasons. Two, if you're buying the goat, you have to put the proper information on the, on the receipt to protect you when you leave with a goat. But I tell them, if something happens on this farm, and not forget the police involved, your information will be given to the police as the last person that visits the farm. Talk to that person. I don't hide it. I tell them straight, say, yo, this is one of the reasons why. So if you have any ideas, don't worry about it because they will come talk, talk to you. If you plan for send a man or you plan for come back yourself, they're going to come talk to you. So that's that's our protocol. You don't have an ID, you can't come through the gate. You know what I mean? You don't get to come in. I'll meet you out there and talk to you. Yeah, see? Colin is, is testifying to it. It's not a joke. Serious. Workers know that. Get now open. Oh, wow, come out there. Come talk to you. Stand at the gate. Talk all you want. If you're not serious about buying a goat, you can't come in. We can talk about business right out there. I can tell you what I have. I tell you what I don't have. And if you're interested, then hand over the, the ID and come look at the one you think you like. And most of the time I got pictures of them on my phone so I can show it right on my phone right there. And if you say, yo, I like that one, I'm like, okay, come, you can come look at it in person, hand over the documents, stick that in my pocket, let's go. Take a picture right away. And yeah, that's, a, that's one of the big things we do on the farm. To let people know that, yo, you know what? Let me think twice about this because I am going to get a call. Yeah. So you guys think about it. Think about how you can protect the little things you can do to create deterrence. Number one thing, you shouldn't have no, people just come in and walk up and in your farm. It's biosecurity issues right off the bat. You know? Biosecurity issues right off the bat. So if a man is reluctant or whatever and you don't feel comfortable telling him you want his ID, say, yo, you can't come in because of biosecurity, bro. Disease and them things, you can't come in. Because, as I said, the guy who came to the lady farm Come take the go with them. He knew exactly where to go. Somebody told him. Or he may have visited it, visited their delivering, or I don't know what happened, but he knew exactly where to go. So the people them that comes on the farm and have ability to walk in, it's my our really good friends, vet and nutritionists. I don't know of anybody else that are allowed to come into the farm. 
and have and have the ability to get through that goat yard gate. Nobody else. Everybody else stand out on that driveway and look through the fence. And it's part of the security system. All part of it. You're not going to come in and scope out and see how many cameras over there, where they are, all that stuff. No. <clears throat> and our dog, Major, is a big deterrence because they can stand there and watch him jump six, seven feet in the air every day, all day. They can stand and watch that dog in the pen jump six, seven feet all the time. Everybody comes, they have to have visual on major. Um, there's a Belgian Malinois, crazy dog, don't have access to the animals, and that dog will jump. Well, you guys, if anybody in here familiar with them dogs, you know how they can jump. Delivery guys come, they're like, yo, look at that dog. Like, seriously, I don't want to deal with that dog. Yeah. A deterrence because in your head you're like, yo, if I come at night, that dog there room this place, I can't get away from him. No care how high I go, where I go, this dog will get up there. Part of the system. I think he, I think Major needs some training, disciplinary training or obedience training, whatever it is, but it's all good. We'll get there if, if it's not too late. If you guys know a good dog trainer, link me up. Tell them to give me a link. Let me see if I can get this dog to its potential, to her potential when it comes to obedience. Um... Yeah, so that's my rant on on um, the pretty larceny situation. Since we it was an active comment this week, um, as I said, I'll recap the things that I think people should consider right off the bat is if you're going to start the operation. Think about your security. How are you going to protect the animals, protect your investment? Proper fencing, lights, camera, dogs, and a protocol for visitors. A proper protocol for visitors. When they show up, you're going to come in, hand over your valid driver's license, or a government ID, take a picture of it, document everything, keep a log of it, and in the event anything happened, turn that over to the cops and say, yo, call this, check these people. They're the last ones who came. Or these are the last five people that came to the farm last week or whatever it is. And tell the people it's part of your system so they will think twice about coming back. If they had any, you know, thoughts of doing a thing, they may think twice about it because now you have their picture and information on record. Now, we're serious about this thing. If you don't have ID, you can't come in. I would care to go out to the gate to you if we really want the seal. But you still have to have ID for you, to, to, at least the driver. Got to have ID for me to do the receipt. I'm not doing a receipt based on you telling me your name. I need the receipt. I need the ID, where you live, where you're going, at least the driver. Because when you get pulled over by law, you have to have a receipt with the proper information on the receipt. Mr. Henry, send me this in WhatsApp or something, please, so I don't forget. Oh, that's a fencing. I thought it was a dog thing. Um, 
All right, so that's that. Let's talk about something that's near and dear to me as the production manager at Cabra Ranch. All things production efficiency and operations <clears throat> drops on my shoulders, my lap, my head, everything. I don't know if Trudy is still here. Because she always going to drop in and say, yep, that's how it goes. It's your problems, not mine. Um, rotational grazing. Um, so, does anybody here don't know? <laughs> yeah, Judy, back a sick. Smarty point here, you know. Maybe six smarty point. You go on, go on, trouble me, yeah. Go on, trouble me. <laughs> um, anybody here doesn't know what rotational grazing is? If you don't know what rotational grazing is, please drop a comment and let me give a quick overview of it instead of assuming everybody know what it is. If you don't know what it is, give me a quick thing, a quick comment. If not, I'm gonna assume everybody knows what rotational grazing is, so I won't get into details of it. I'll just jump into how to set it up. <laughs> Peter said, give it anyway. Okay, all right, so rotational grazing for livestock. Rotational grazing for livestock is, let's say you have two acres of land and you create two pastures out of that that you're going to use to graze your animals. Now, rotational grazing is try to figure out if you have 20 animals, 20 goats or 20 cows, you the, before you start rotation grazing, you need to figure out how much dry matter that pasture is producing. Dry matter is what the animals will eat. How much are they how much is that pasture is producing per square foot or whatever it is, right? There is ways to calculate it. That's why rotational grazing is not as simple as people think it is, as just moving goats around, moving animals around. It's not that simple. So you got to figure out how much dry matter per square foot the pasture is producing. Once you figure that out, you will be able to tell how many animals you can have in a specific space based on how much the animals should eat in order to get what they need, right? So once you figure all that out, now to set up the rotation of grazing is if you have a pasture, which is say a hundred, well, I'll talk off base what we have, a hundred feet wide by three, 400 feet long. What you want to do is you cut it up in paddocks. So the pasture may be one acre, but then you're going to cut up that one acre pasture in paddocks, small sections. And in order to figure out how big that paddock is, is where the, the, the dry matter content comes in. Based on the screw, how much dry matter you have per square footage, you know that, yo, if it's 100 feet by 60 feet, the square footage of that, you know how much dry matter is in there. So you know how, how many animals can eat in there for the day and get what they need out of it. The stocking rate. That's what they call that. The stocking rate of your pasture. Of your pasture. Why? Well, my talk about pasta. So what we do is we did... If, if an evaluation on our pasture. 
Not that we needed it because we have grass that was, you know, six feet tall or whatever. So we know that, you know, we got, it was pretty, the dry matter was there. However, we wanted to know what was the nutrient value of the pasture because it also helps with knowing that, okay, if we're going to give X amount of animals Y space, then we know that the nutrient value is enough. They'll be good, right? Now, when you create a paddock, you figure that out and create your paddocks based on how many animals you're going to have in that space. You have to be religious when it comes to moving the animals through that pasture. The rule of thumb is three days the most, especially if you don't have a lot of space. Three days the most, and that's based on the dry matter, the volume of the dry matter in the pasture. The reason it's three days per paddock is because on the fourth day, the eggs, the worm eggs that was dropped on the first day will be hatching on the fourth day. And that means the goats are going to start ingesting worms. And that's where your worm problem will start. The worms that affect goats and ruminant animals takes the life cycle is 21, 22 days according to the science. Based on the last update and research I got and that I've read is 21 days is the life cycle of these worms by what is it? The Luke fluke worm and whatever all of them is. You know what I mean? 21 days. But one to four to, to four days is the hatching cycle. So you do not want to go past the third day with the animals in the same paddock. So what we do for us, we move them every day. So we create a paddock in a pasture. One the number one pasture, I think, is a hundred feet wide. And the reason it's a hundred feet wide is because we use the mobile fence that is a hundred feet long. So we can use the mobile fence to chop it, this long pasture. The length of it is maybe 300, maybe 500 feet or something. But we create these rectangular paddocks with the, the mobile fence by cutting up this long pasture. Every day, they get a fresh paddock. Right? Every day, they get a fresh paddock. And the reason, as I said, is you don't want them eating in the same spot on consecutive days. The most is three days. But if you have the space, only do one day. Now, the whole idea is to keep those animals moving every day. And it's mimicking what they would do in the wild. When animals are moving in the wild, they will only come back to a spot if it's something they really like is there. They won't come back to that spot, especially in the wild because of them droppings and all them things. They don't like that. So they're not coming back there. They just keep moving ahead. You got to remember, they keep walking. They're not, they're not being going back to a house or a yard or something. They're just moving every day. They're just moving. So they're not coming back. They're not going backwards. You know what I mean? They may come back on another cycle and remember that, yo, there was some Lucina or something that them love and they come. But in reality, in during their natural state, they just keep moving every day. So you're trying to mimic that with rotational grazing. And because they feed in a group, hence 
you're cutting up the pasta into smaller products. So they eat in a group. And there's so many benefits to that. One, you maximize how much they eat, how much dry matter they eat in a in a space. And they're dropping, they're do they're dropping their 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 feces in clusters, which in turn fertilize that space. If they're completely spread out, it takes more of them to actually do the work of fertilizing that. So if they're in small and they're grouped, then the dropping is more concentrated. We create more better fertilizing. So the rotation of them going through the pasture in small space paddocks, for us, it takes you know, at least six weeks for them to come back to pasture one. By the time they come back to pasture one, the worm cycle, the, the life cycle of the worms gone. It's, you know, they hatch and do them life cycle and drop dead. The the forage has get a chance to grow back to its most nutritional state. And everything just regenerates and they get fresh forage again, right? So the advantage is really great if you figure out how to properly do rotational grazing. It keeps the worm load down. The animals are getting fresh forage every day as if when you let them out loose, they're still getting that. And you are managing the available forage that you have. You're properly managing it. But there's data that you have to keep in mind. There's data you have to keep in mind. You can't put animals in a space that they're overgrazing or there's not enough forage for them. So you got to know what your stocking density is, what your stocking rate is, what's the dry matter content of the pasture, you know? How thick is the pasture? How, how much grass is in there? How much stuff is in there? You know? And there's calculations. There's like Excel sheet that will tell you, you know what I mean, based on the dry matter content of a space, how many how many goats can go in there, how many cows can go in there. Like there's, there's an Excel sheet you just put the information in and it tells you, it will tell you. And it's based on, you can say, yo, I want them to eat 70% of that that's available. And it will calculate and tell you how many animals you can put in there for how many days. Guys, say good night to Trudy. I think she's gonna be out of link for a bit. Um, yeah. Um, so after you, you you figure out what's the proper stocking rate for your pasture, and um, and and then how much of, let's see, how long it's going to take you to get back to pasture one, to paddock one. If you're going to, if you're not going to get, if, you, if you're going to get back to paddock one, like say on day 18, then you got a problem. Your stocking rate is too much. Because you're coming back before the life cycle of the worms. So there is a science behind it. The whole objective is do not come back until the life cycle of the worms dead is gone and is expired, and you give the, the forage enough time to regenerate, to come back to the most nutrition nutritional state 
which is usually if rain's falling or you're doing irrigation and stuff, six, seven weeks. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, sometimes we have to move through the pasture faster or give the animals bigger space to get them through in a rainy season because by the time we come back around on the six weeks or seven weeks, grass is just out of control. Shouldn't because you can have the ability to manage to do further management of cutting it and using it to make silage or cut and carry. So, the possibility this is if you have the space, gentlemen. If you can do this, I'm telling people who have the space and have a little bit how to use it to the best of their ability. So if you need a minimum of 21 paddocks. Now, remember what I said. If you don't have that many, if you don't have that much space to say 21 paddocks to come back, you can extend the, where they eat up to three days. So that gives you more time. If you understand what I'm saying, it gives you more time in there to come back around. Because if you're doing two or three days per paddock, by the time you go through, number one paddock will have time to regenerate and the worms on that paddock will regenerate, will die off. The life cycle of that, of those worms will die out. So there is that you have to consider. You have the ability to extend to up to three days. And there's further way of managing the worm load on your pasture. Is if you find a goat with worm, do not send that goat out to the pasture. Keep that goat in until you are re rehabilitate the worm situation in that goat. Let that goat drop all those worms in a controlled environment through the slatted floor into the thing underneath. And you're actually killing off those worms. You're stopping its dead end for those worms that's in that goat. So if you're grazing and you find a goat with heavy worm load, pull that goat from pasture while you treat the worm load. And that goat will be passing out those worms in a dead, a dead hole situation. It's not being dropped on the pasture for to further infect the pasture, infest the pasture. Maximilian says, if you continuously do silage and you rotate that with grazing, can this help in breaking worm, worm life cycle? Yes, it does. The longer it takes you to get back to pasture one, paddock number one, the better chance you have of mitigating a worm situation. And this is based on the research that I've done and based on talking to people who do research on grazing. You know, we've had Dr. O'Brien, that is a scientist in worm small ruminants worm situation and I got that directly from her um, so managing the worm situation when you're grazing is it just comes down to being vigilant in recognizing an animal that has worm don't let that animal go out and and drop those worms in your pasture you identify it keep it in while you treat it it lessens the chance of, the, of you know, those worms being in your pasture. Now, there's another way to help manage worms on your pasture. That is adding the likes of cattle, two cow or something. For us, we have two cow, cherry and old baby. And their only job, so I mean, you forget bread no still, but their only job on the farm is to manage the pasture. 
eat down what the goat them not eat. So we don't have whole grass or whatever. Because sometimes, especially when conditions are right and grass are grow fast. If you if we don't have control over getting the grass down to a certain level, then it gets old and get too much and the goats don't want to eat it. But if you if we what we do with Cherry and Old Baby is they follow the goats four days behind the goats, ideally. Sometimes it's longer, but ideally four days behind the goats. They will keep the pastures in control at a certain level. And the biggest benefit from us is the cows are a dead end host for the worms that affect the goats and vice versa. The worms that affect the goats don't affect the cows and the cows, the worm that affect the cows doesn't affect the goats. If you guys understand what I'm saying here. So they got two jobs. They help clean up the pasture behind the, 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 the goats and they also where the worm is con concerned. If they ingest the worms from the goats, it's a dead end host. And also they eat on the pasture to a, a manageable state that we get good fresh regrowth when they move on. <laughs> Hey, dude, that's uh, when you're on the farm, you gotta have fun, man. Cherry and no baby, yeah. There are two um, red pool females that are there, I think they're due to be bred. So, I don't know if we're doing AI or what we're doing yet. I don't know, we'll see. Um, Well, it's nice to have a problem of too much grass. Well, this can never be too much grass, man. If you're managing this operation properly, like we're not doing the best job on Carver Ranch of managing and utilizing all that stuff. I should have, you know, silage piled to the roof of that of that uh, building we got them in. Like we just, we're not diligent enough. We're not disciplined enough. We're not structured enough. As good as we think we are, I look at it and I'm like, no, this thing should be piled to the roof with silage. It's just that there's not enough time in the day or, you know what I mean? Like, you know, we need extra hands or whatever it is to get it done. But really and truly, I, I shouldn't be making some of this stuff go to waste. I should either figure out a way to either bring extra hands in and put it in, but it can't, yeah, there's equipment that does it efficiently. If you have to do it manually, it takes too long. And that's part of the problem. You know, but we have to figure it out. You know what I mean? We have to get there. Yeah, Maurice, you know what I'm saying? It's a work in progress. Like, you know, we will get there, but it's part of our overall business plan you know man um we have to get there we have to structure things accordingly the only reason we're not doing it on a consistent basis is because we don't own a machine that does it efficiently and for to do it manually it takes too long for two people to do it so we have to bring a whole team in and yeah so but we're gonna figure it out we will figure it out. Um, so um, back to the whole rotational grazing. So now the biggest benefit of doing proper rotational grazing is you always have good, fresh pastures for your animals. You know, and I would tell people, if you're raising goats, don't have people come in and tell you if you have this space and want to plant and they talk about fodder bank and proper pastures and things. Yo, let it grow. If you got grass, let it grow. 
if the goat them love the grass, let everything grow in there and let the goat them go in and they will tell you what you need to do. Okay? They will tell you, the goats will tell you from your observation what you need to do to improve the pasture. I was told what I need to do to our pasture until we did the evaluation because I'm not the dude to take people word, you know. Me not like take people word. I want facts. I want the scientific backup to it. Don't come tell me say me need to dig up all of that and plant pangola or plant African star or plant whatever. No. First of all, tell me what I got first. What do I have and why do I need to replace it? If I had listened to people, I would have brought in a tractor, dig up everything you guys see at Carver Ranch and plant whatever. I said, no, I want to know what I currently have. What is the nutrient value of what I currently have? And when we did it and it come back, I was surprised. I had to ask. I'm like, dude, you sure this is correct? We were at 15 to 17% cool protein on an average in those pastures. Not about predominantly Guinea grass, you know. Predominantly Guinea grass. But here, the, here's the catch. There are these little wisps and little legumes and stuff that's growing in between. And it's a lot of them. It's not isolated. It's every guinea grass root that you see. I get, you guys go and watch that video. You'll see them. It, made, it created a diverse pasture in a natural state. So the animals love that. They love the fact that they can go in there and they can get these candies and all these things in there before them jump on the main course of the, of the guinea grass. And if we do what we need to do and manage it properly, it's just going to keep getting better. It's just going to keep improving. So that's what we do. I didn't dig up anything or whatever. There's some, you know, stuff in there I see them don't eat and I would like to get rid of them. But overall, they love the pasture. And we're getting the results we need because our animals that go grazing are all maintenance animals. And they all need more than 8 10% crude protein to do what they do. They just want enough of it. They want to bang up and come back, look like barrels. Yeah, so rotational grazing, you don't need a lot of land to do proper rotational grazing based on your stocking. See what I'm saying? I was told by now all my animals are going to die from worm overload. The whole place is going to be filled with worm. And I got worm medicine on my farm expiring because on an average per year, we may only worm six or seven goats, and we have a hundred and we have over about hundred and five mature mothers, breeding mothers. You know, overall animals, we have hundred and thirty-five, forty. Yeah, I gotta get an update. Come from Trudy, you know that we have all these kids on the ground, on the ground, but. Yeah, and that's because of the rotation grazing, rotational grazing. It's a managed process, a managed process, but can't emphasize that enough. If you're going to graze and do proper grazing, make it a part of your management. 
make it a part of how you manage the farm and you will see the results. Now, if you don't have the land, then this is not even a conversation. If you have an acre, two acre, then plant grass, cut and carry, do whatever you need to do to do an intensive system. You know what I mean? If you plan to really make it a business, the space you have should be prioritized to growing your business and having some form of secure feed security. If you have small space like some people do, and you can only house the goats, then you have to figure out another way to feed them. Whether your father bank is off-site, you lease a land and do father bank off-site. I don't know how some people just buy here and grain and feed their animals. I don't know how they do it. Just finding grass for cut wherever is not feed security because any day you can go there and a man fence up the place and say, yo, you can't come cut the grass. So you got to have consistent access, right? So my advice is if you, where you house the goats, only have space to house the goats, then you should have an offsite fodder bank that you can get access to feed on a regular basis. Um, there's a question. Your science base, so your shrubs act as romanizer naturally. Yeah, if there's if there's shrubs and legumes out there or whatever out there that has tannin in it that naturally organically helps with with uh, worm control, then sure. You know, what I mean, I just promote them eating what's out there. It's their home. It's their environment. They need to learn to live off of it. If there's an animal that is struggling being part of the grazing herd, she gets flagged to get called. They need to figure out how to live off what's there because it's the same thing they're getting cut and carry from. So if you're struggling in the system, the system is not for you. You move on. You know what I mean? If you, we, and, and that's happened to us, you know, there's just goats that just don't, it just don't work for them. They can never stay healthy. So they, the only time they're healthy is if they're an intensive system, if they stay in the goat house and get pampered. Not here. Goat house is just for production. Go down at a lounge, go back lounge and go, gra go eat grass. And we have enough space, you know, thankfully, give thanks, blessed enough to have enough space to have 200 females comfortably. If we need to grow past that, then I have to reassess my grazing strategy or get more land, try to get access to more land. So yeah, um, that's my uh, that's our system. That's what rotation the benefits of rotational grazing and how rotational grazing works. If you guys have any questions, I'll you know drop them in the comments and I'll try to answer them at the best I can. And please mind, please know that everything I talk about is the stuff I do on the farm stuff we implement on the farm i can speak on these things because these are the things we do if i don't do it a cobra ranch i do not speak on it with authority i defer it to a professional guest so that's why i don't talk about details of deworming and this and that because i'm not a vet i'm not a specialist at it so I get them people to come talk about it. But stuff that is very effective on the farm, like our grazing and the way we feed the animals and the way we do our killing season and stuff, that happens on the farm and I can measure the success of that and I speak on it. 
So if you guys have any questions, I will take questions, explain them as to the best of my ability. So let's go. Any questions? If you don't have no questions, I'm going to call it a night, you know. Because we are like an hour and a half in. Um, so here's the thing. So the cows ideally travel, go is graze four days behind the goats. So sometimes it's longer if we want them to cut it down, eat it down a little more. But the whole idea is for them to manage height of the pasture, behind the goats. And they're also doing their droppings and all that stuff and everything. But ideally, four days behind the goats. There's some sections of the farm that the cows don't go to because there's not structured fencing for them. When the goats go up behind the cottages and stuff, it's just mobile fencing that's up there in different, different formations. So the cows don't go up there. The cows just sit over by close to the goat house for a couple of days, four days or whatever it is until the cows, until the goats get back through pasture one. Once the goats go through pasture one, then the cows will come back into pasture one behind them. So, yeah, there's no, there's no, um, like, written in stone rule. We just have a guidance of four days behind the goats. And then the, the science of that is the, uh, the worms are hatching four days. So that's where the four days come from. That's where the minimum of four days come from. Because the worms are hatching on the fourth day. So... Whatever worms from the goats are hatching on the fourth day, the cows have the capability of ingesting that. And that the cows is a dead host, so it helps kill, kill off those worms. If, if that makes sense. So the goats are in there the first day. They're dropping their, 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 their feces. The feces that hits the ground, whatever worm eggs are in there on the fourth day those eggs are gonna hatch four days of sitting there so now if come the fourth or fifth day the cow come in there's a good chance the cow eat down and eat down and start ingesting some of those worms that are hatching after the fourth day fifth day whatever and then the cow is a dead host because it, those worms don't affect them so they're killing off some of those worms in the process. So that's how we manage to keep our worm load down, have healthy pastures, healthy goats, and all of that. You know, this is a question that was asked by Peter. Any other questions? If you guys find this very informative, very please do share with people you think will learn from this. Um, knowledge is power, and I keep telling people that they need to get into researching and spend the time to watch stuff like this, ask questions. So if you guys know of anyone who's getting in or anyone that's actually in it that needs to know some of this stuff, they should watch this, share it with them. You know what I mean? It's, it will be live. It will be available on I Go Chat page, Cabra Ranch page on Facebook, and the YouTube channel, Cabra Ranch YouTube channel. They'll be there sitting. And we've shared the link in a lot of the groups already, so they, they'll have access to it. Um, so there you go. So if there's no further questions, I'm going to bid you all good night. And thank you all for being here. Thanks for uh, participating as usual. 
This is the iGood family. We give thanks and blessings all the time. For our Canadian friends, happy Thanksgiving. You guys know that, you know, I'm a Canadian, I'm Jamaican youth that spend a lot of time in Canada. So, you know, we still know how it go. And everybody, I want to thank you all for participating. And as I said before, if you find this valuable, this information valuable, please share. You can, you know, ask questions after the fact by messaging me or asking the comments. All right. So, Peter, big respect. Thanks. Kenneth, big respect. Thank you guys for hanging out. Natty from, Ch from Chelsea Best Farm, big up. Maurice. You know what I mean? Everybody that participated, Mario, Maximilian, um, Kareen, Garth, or Shane, the list goes on and on and on. Thank you all for participating. Thanks for being here. And we'll see you all next week. Peace out.